Hello and welcome to Oceanside Library. Thank you for joining us for great socially distanced local and overnight trips. Today with us we have local author Sandra Mardenfeld, who is also a local Oceanside resident. Uh, Sandra is the author of New York Day Trips by Theme and that's what she'll be showing us today. Thank you so much Sandra for joining us. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Hi everybody, it's so nice seeing you today and thank you so much for coming uh, to the lecture. Um, I'm going to allow um, questions at the end of the presentation. And so um, what I tried to focus on for this lecture were um, trips that you could take right now in this crazy time of pandemic where we are trying to social distance and be safe. And I also wanted to look at some of the destinations that I absolutely loved. Uh, researching this book was a joy and getting to visit so many wonderful places uh, was just so much fun. And you forget how much we have in New York and what's available to us. Uh, we're very lucky. So this is the book and it's called New York Day Trips by Theme. And that's um, how they arrange things. So if you like spas, there's a chapter on spas. If you like casinos, there's a chapter on casinos, sports events, hikes, natural wonders, museums, nostalgia, all kinds of different topics. So you can easily find the topics that you enjoy. Um, and you can also kind of mix and match trips, which is nice because some of these uh, mentioned different destinations and you can like take two or three of them and make, you know, a weekend of it or, you know, an overnight. Um, so, so that's the book. On the cover, you'll see this is a Bolt Castle, which I'm gonna talk about in a little bit. That was one of my favorite destinations. We went there last summer as a family, and I'll tell you more in a bit. Um, this book is available in bookstores from Barnes & Noble, um, Amazon, um, bookshop.org. Um, so it's available in quite a few different places. And uh, the first place I wanted to talk about is Sagrates. So Sagrates is one of these uh, little towns that are just adorable. Uh, we were just there, my family and I went j there just two weeks ago. Um, it's a really doable drive. It's like two hours and about an hour and 15 minutes of that is very picturesque and beautiful. Um, Sagrates is right by the Hudson River and you have a beautiful view of the Catskill Mountains and you can hike in the Catskill Mountains. Uh, one of the nice things about the little town is there is a ton of outdoor dining um, and it's recommended that you make reservations on weekends because it can get packed. Uh, there's also a really lovely farmer's market. The farmer's market has kind of, kind of downsized because of the pandemic. Um, typically the farmer's market has a, like a children's spot with activities and crafts. It has live music, um, all of that they've kind of done away with this year. Um, but you can still buy lots of groceries and food and homemade pies um, and all of that. Um, what I love about Sorgatis is there's such great hiking. I'm going to mention a couple of places in a second. And uh, there's um, a couple of museums. Uh, you'll see there's a picture there of a Pepsi bottle from Woodstock. Uh, so there's a Woodstock Museum, which is in Sogarties, not Woodstock, but if you wanted to go to Woodstock, it really is very close to Sogarties, and there's all kinds of things you can look at there. Um, there's an animal sanctuary, and there's museums, and all kinds of wonderful shopping, um, outdoor dining. Um, just as a little, you know, celebrity aside, Jimmy Fallon grew up in Sogarties, so it has its own resident celebrity. Um, one thing about Sagrates is after um, pandemic, there are a lot of festivals. So even if you go see it now in August or September or October, um, I would also say come back um, after there's a vaccine and the world kind of restores to normalcy uh, because they have so many wonderful festivals. Uh, Hits on the Hudson is a horseback riding equestrian festival. Um, HITS is a, a giant stable. Uh, it's really kind of amazing. They have all kinds of food festivals, including their famous garlic festival. And if you're looking for a place to stay, um, it's not a paid endorsement, but I did stay here at the Villa at Sogates, um, which was a really cute uh, bed and breakfast, very small, um, so great for social distancing. I think they had like seven bedrooms, so they really don't have that many guests. And the best part about it was um, 
the it's a husband and wife team who run it and the husband used to work for the food network and he's quite the good chef and he makes the most amazing breakfasts in the morning for you um, so that's a little bit of background on Socrates. So these are a couple of sites in Socrates that I totally love. Um, Opus 40, uh, I just think it's such an inspiring story. There was this professor and artist, Harvey Fite, and he traveled the world. Um, he worked as a professor at, at Pace University and he just spent 37 years of his life building this kind of sculpture park. Um, first he built his house and, and he did this all on his own. He was a self-taught carpenter and he um, built his house on this um, like old bluestone quarry. And then he decided that he was gonna start um, sculpting statues. And there's quite a few of them that you can see throughout the park. And then when you look at this picture, what this picture is, it's called the monolith. So as uh, Fight was developing this land, and he did everything in this land. Um, he, all that masonry work, all that stonework, uh, that was him. Um, year after year, he'd spend his summers off uh, developing his land. And once he built um, that stone structure and the pathways, he looked at it and said, you know, it really needs something. And so he found this um, stone in the river and it was something like nine tons and he got it out, he brought it to his land and then he raised it into be this monolith. What I think is amazing about um, his work is he uses something called dry keystone masonry, which means he's laying stone without mortar. Um, this was something that he had learned about, and he also sort of practiced um, in the Mayan culture. Um, he had an interesting life. He traveled all over the place. He went on a dig um, to, you know, find um, on a Mayan uh, ruin site. Um, and he brought all of that to his property and built it himself. Uh, one of the wonderful things is there's a Quarrymen's Museum on the property. And it shows how Fight built all of these things and the techniques he used. Um, it's a beautiful spot, a great place for contemplation. And it's, um, you know, you overlook the overlook mountains. Uh, typically in the normal summer, they would have a lot of concerts there. There are some free socially distanced community events going on. You can look at their event calendar if you are interested in that. Uh, it kind of has a sad story. Uh, he died as he was, um, you know, working on his property um, and he fell and um, he passed away. But his wife so was inspired by his work and his dedication to building this, um, made it uh, this park. And it's funny because you can see his uh, stepson actually lives on a house on the property. It's not part of the exhibits, uh, but you can see you can see where he lives. I don't know if I would like that personally, having people visit a museum site where my house was, but um, there it is. Uh, the Sorgates Lighthouse is another place that I completely love visiting. Uh, probably one of the reasons is the hike is doable by anybody. Any level hiker can do the Sorgates Lighthouse hike. Um, but what you need to do is you need to look at the water tables before you start the hike because the trail floods. So if you go at the wrong time, it's gonna be wet and muddy and you might actually have to uh, walk through ankles or knee length of water depending on the tide tables. Right now, um, they're redeveloping part of this lighthouse. So part of the trail is uh, not passable. Um, interestingly, there is, um, the trail leads to this lighthouse that was made in 1869, which is in the middle of the Hudson River. And the lighthouse has a bed and breakfast, which usually is booked up years, if not months in advance. Um, right now it is open according to the website. Um, so you can maybe get a date there. Um, and there's a really nice uh, museum inside the lighthouse, but you do have to sign up for a tour. You just can't show up. 
Uh, one of the things I love about the lighthouse is when the deck is open, you can see it's a beautiful deck um, and you're invited to bring sandwiches and have a picnic lunch. And because this is only accessible through that one trail and by boat, um, it's a really lovely, isolated, um, calm place to sit and um, have a meal and just ponder. Um, so it was one of the things I really enjoyed doing. Um, Saugerties is a wonderful place if you like to hike. Uh, they have so many wonderful hikes. And um, I'm just gonna tell you about a couple of them, some general information, and then I'm gonna show you some photos. So um, Falling Waters Preserve is really in a nearby Glasgow, not Saugerties proper, um, but it's like, you know, a 10 minute drive. And this is a really wonderful hike because it has um, some waterfalls you can see, and it also have the ruins of the Mulford Ice House. Uh, the Mulford Ice House uh, was a windowless house that used to hold about 10,000 tons of ice every winter. This was before the days of refrigeration. Um, and you can see the ruins and it's kind of interesting to take a look at. Uh, it also has these amazing views of the Catskills. Uh, so that's pretty nice. There's a bunch of um, rock ledges that are very picturesque to see. And one of my favorite parts is the Red Trail in particular is really easy, very doable and family friendly. Um, and that leads to the river and the riverside view is really beautiful. Um, there's fishing, hiking, um, cross country skiing and snowshoeing available in this preserve. Uh, Espos Ben is in Socrates itself and it was part of the old Schroeder farm. That's what the locals will call it. And it's known, um, but it has been a farm for about 40 years. It's known especially for having um, a ton of animals. Um, you can see turkey and deer and eagles. Um, I've, I've heard you can see coyotes. I've never seen that myself. Foxes, um, a ton of animals, great place for bird watching. One of the reasons why you can see so many animals there is because of the diverse landscape it has. Um, you know, th these paths go everything from wetlands to lowland meadows to forests. Um, so you can really see quite a, a lot of variety in nature. Um, they also have wonderful hiking trails. And what I love about this uh, place is that you can also um, go to their website and they have uh, scheduled and guided nature walks, um, birding tours, um, kayaking and canoe tours. So they, it really runs the gamut um, for activity. Uh, Black Creek Preserve um, is one of these places I really love. Uh, my family tried to go there actually two weeks ago, but it was closed because of the recent tropical storm had knocked down some trees. So we went into this uh, Soapy Neck Ridge, which I'll talk about in a second. So these, this is a very family friendly uh, preserve and they have three trails. And I don't want you to be deceived because if you do this trip, um, the first part is a little bit steep. And I have what I call my, my, my company of whiners, my family, my four children, my husband. So they are all the ones that as soon as it gets a little steep, start, start crying a little bit. Uh, but we do like to go on hikes. Um, and so this is a really nice place. Um, it has this wonderful suspension bridge. I'll show you a picture in a second. Uh, which the kids really have a good time going through. It's a really neat kind of thing. And what's nice about this preserve is this fishing along with the usual hiking, cross country, um, snowshoeing activities. Uh, Soapy Neck Ridge actually is not in the book. All these other things were mentioned in my book, New York Day Trips, um, because I just discovered it. Um, that's the one thing I love about Sorgates is you can go up there and you're always discovering new, new things. Like I said, we had driven two hours to go to Black Creek Preserve. Um, I always check the website before I go to these places just to make sure. Andra? Yeah. I'm so sorry to interrupt. You just went out for like a full, like three or four sentences there. Could you just repeat the, maybe the last oh. minute or so? Oh, <laughs> I'm so cool. sorry. No, not a problem. <laughs> Thank you. So, Sorbonne um, Ridge is a place that we just discovered two weeks ago. We went up there and I always check the websites before I visit any of my hiking locations. And even though the website didn't mention anything about it being closed when we got up there, it was closed. 
Um, but I love the hiking community because as we were turning out, um, another car had driven up and we had rolled down the window. We told them it's closed so they didn't have to pull all the way into the, the um, parking lot. And they had mentioned um, this about this hike and so we did this instead. Um, this is a really fun um, area. Uh, the ridge has eight trails. It's a huge park. Um, we ended up on the white trail, which we didn't realize was the hardest. <laughs> Oops. So it was really steep and there was a lot of tree roots and a lot of um, kind of undeveloped paths. You know, they were clear, but it was very, you know, um, packed dirt and a lot of grass, um, very easy to um, miss your footing. So you had to be careful, but you are rewarded with a beautiful waterfall at the end of it. Um, what I would rather recommend is, and we discovered this afterward, is if you go down to Poppletown Road, you will find the other seven, the beginnings of the other seven trails. And um, some of those trails are much easier. One goes around a lake and then some beautiful views. So a very nice place to go. Uh, what I'll say about all of these parks um, is they're dog friendly. As long as you bring um, a leash and you have a leashed pet, you can go hiking with your dog, which is a really nice thing. And um, really nice places where you can have picnics. Uh, there was a family out of Shorpenick Ridge who was having a lovely picnic. Um, I do wanna warn you that these areas have very small parking lots. Um, so you're best to go early. Um, you know, I think the um, parking lot of Black Creek Preserve maybe holds 30 people. Um, falling waters maybe a little less. Uh, Shorty Neck Ridge maybe it's like 10. So it's something to keep in mind. So I'm going to show you some pictures. So this is falling waters. So they have kind of these low level waterfalls there. Um, you can see it's more like a babbling creek. Um, but what I love about Falling Waters, because I like to sit during my hikes, is they have a ton of these kind of wood-hewn um, benches all along. So you can take plenty of rests and um, really just enjoy nature. Um, here's another of one of their waterfalls. Um, Espes Bend, you can see it's a little bit different. Um, you know, this is one of more of their meadow walks heading towards the forest. And um, another nice thing about all of these preserves is they're open all year round. So if you want to go in the fall, um, it's a completely different look than if you went in the summer. So you can constantly rediscover these beautiful um, areas um, all year long. Um, so here's the view of uh, Hudson River, the Black Creek Preserve. You can see it's, it's really quite lovely. And um, this is the suspension bridge. Uh, so it's really a lot of fun. It rocks when you're walking across, so it makes you a little bit nervous, uh, but it is steady. Um, so that's my family. This is my, the whining crew, um, as I mentioned. Uh, so this is, we go hiking um, at least once a week during the summer. Uh, this is when we were at Chopinic Ridge. And one thing I liked about the ridge is it's not a very crowded path. Uh, so you, especially in this time of social distancing, you can take off your mask for great stretches and just walk um, without it on, which is an, a nice thing. And then uh, the hikers are very respectful. Uh, everyone we pass put the mask back on as they were passing each other. Um, and you can see that's our dog, Luna. Luna comes with us on most of our hikes. Uh, we try to find hikes that are dog friendly. And you can see the path here is kind of rough hewn, um, dirt, stone, it's a little bit narrow, um, but you know, more than sufficiently marked, you're not gonna get lost here. All right, we're gonna move to another area that I really loved um, while I was researching this book. And this is a place that my family visited uh, last summer. You know, my family loved this project that I worked on because I got to go visit so many places. Um, the Thousand Islands, if you've never been there, it's about six hours away. So it's kind of um, a little bit of a hike. Uh, we drove halfway and stayed in a hotel um, halfway there, and then we drove the other half. There is a ton of camping. That's the one nice thing, and bed and breakfasts over there. Uh, so we stayed on a campsite when we got there. Um, so it was a very popular uh, vacation destination during the Gilded Age, and um, many wealthy people would 
make a, a house on an island. It would be their own private island, and that's where they would vacation in the summer, your own private island. How nice is that? Um, one of the fun things about the Thousand Islands is you can see a lot of uh, battle sites from the War of 1812, like Sackett's Harbor Battlefield uh, Historic Site. Um, the only problem with uh, coronavirus and Thousand Islands is a lot of the sites are in Ontario, Canada. Uh, so some of those battle sites you can't see right now because you can't get into Canada um, because of the pandemic. Um, one of the big things to do there is to take these scenic boat tours. There's a lot of things you can see. You can tour the different islands, um, and there's literally thousands of them um, in uh, the St. Lawrence River. And, you know, it's fun because you can see these beautiful, um, like, mansions um, and these wonderful docks. And then you see also kind of these shanties. Um, you'll pass by and you'll pass by abandoned um, places that are all, you know, in disrepair. Um, one island we passed just had a gas grill on it. That's it. I guess fishermen go there and they make their hamburgers and then they go fishing again. Um, so there's a, a lot of things to see. There's um, a couple of lighthouses you can go visit. And there's Bolt Castle. And Bolt Castle is one of the big sites, which I'm going to show you in a second. Um, if you like adventure sports, there's all kinds of things like white water rafting. Um, there's a zip line and adventure park. And um, you can scuba dive wrecks. There's quite a few wrecks. Um, one of them is outside the main town, Exalander Exal uh, Bay. Um, and it's just off the shoreline, so it's really accessible. Um, and then there's so many water sports, swimming, fishing, stand-up paddling, all kinds of boating. Um, so what I wanted to tell you about Bolt Castle, um, that was truly a, a spectacular uh, visit. Um, this castle was built by George C. Bolt. Um, he's the man um, who created Waldorf Astoria. Uh, the famous hotel in New York City. And uh, it's kind of a love story. He uh, loved his wife, so he was building her this e extravagant vacation home, a uh, 120-room Rhineland-style castle um, and yacht house. And uh, he even had the island shaped like a heart. Um, they physically came in and shaped it like a heart. If you, I'm going to show you an overhead sight in, sh shot in a second. Um, and they call it Heart Island because of that. Um, unfortunately, through the construction, about maybe maybe three quarters, a little more than three quarters finished, his wife passed away. He was so distraught that he immediately suspended all um, construction activity. And the house was never finished. And it was left abandoned. Right now, it's only open through Labor Day weekend um, because of the pandemic. Maybe they will extend that. I'm not sure. Um, typically, this site is open through October. Um, it's only accessible by boat. Uh, there's a lot of private boat companies, so you can hire a private boat to, to go there, or there's also these boat tours where they might combine Boat Castle with um, a tour of the Thousand Islands, with the tour of the lighthouses. Like, there's a couple of them that you can pick. Um, and it's really a, a spectacular uh, trip. So this is... Uh, an overview of the island. You can see it's shaped like a heart and in the middle of it's Bolt Castle. Um, Bolt Castle is just a really wonderful place to visit. It's, a, it's an amazing um, building. The rooms are just so lush and elegant. There's a grand staircase. Um, what's nice is down over here you can see there's um, a yacht house. I would recommend that you spend extra time there because the Yacht House um, has all kinds of boats from the turn of the century. It's very interesting to see. Um, when you come into the site, you come into the boating area, there's a little ice cream parlor and some stores you can go to. And uh, there's plenty of lovely spots for picnicking on the island. Um, there's some beautiful botanical gardens and uh, an awful lot to see. I think my one complaint about my time there was I did not um, book enough time on my tour. I could have used another hour, honestly. Uh, so this is um, a picture of the Yacht House, definitely worth a visit. And this is some of the interiors at Bolt Castle. 
So they made uh, both Castle uh, a museum um, in a historic spot, and they've re um, renovated uh, a great deal of it, like this room, and they've uh, populated with furniture. Um, but there's quite a bit of it that's not renovated at all. Oops, I want to go back. Um, I would say one of the things you want to not miss is the basement. Uh, the basement, you can still see all of these walls full of graffiti from the years that it was abandoned, and that's kind of fascinating. And there's also um, an indoor um, in-ground pool that was never filled, so you can go visit that. It's kind of interesting to see. Um, one tip I have about Bolt Castle is it's not air conditioned and it can be really hot up there if you come visit in the summer. Um, so if you get too hot, the gift store is air conditioned, so you can pop in there. Uh, there's also a really wonderful documentary on the second floor that will explain the history of Bolt uh, Castle. And uh, that also is air conditioned, so that's a nice place to stop off as well. Um, Rock Island Lighthouse is, um, you'll pass it while you're taking your boat to um, Bull Castle. And it's a really interesting lighthouse um, because it also has a, a keeper's dwelling and a boathouse. In fact, they made uh, the keeper's dwelling a museum and gift shop. What's kind of fun is if you're planning a socially distanced wedding, you can rent out the property and have your wedding or a special event there. And only your guests will be on the island um, if, you, if you so wish. Right now it's open um, from mid-May to September. And, um, you know, it's just opened as a park recently. So you can see it's a, a kind of a fun place. It's a small island, uh, very accessible. You can walk up to the lighthouse. Um, it's not handicapped accessible. It's a very kind of a precarious journey up there. Uh, but the Keepers Museum is quite easy to walk in. All right, I'm gonna move on to the Adirondacks area. So the Adirondacks is a huge, huge place to visit. It's actually probably several different vacations um, because it's more than 6 million acres and they have 12 distinct regions. So some of them you may have not heard about like Saranac and Tupper Lake, which is known mostly for water activities. Um, and some of them you might've heard more about like Lake Placid uh, where the Olympics was held long ago, um, Whiteface, where uh, there's a few ski mountains, and of course Lake George, which is kind of a, fine, a family fun destination where you can sail the Minnehaha and visit the um, House of Wax and different things there. Uh, they have a ton of different sites, like the Adirondack Sky Center Observatory, um, the, Mac the Nation's Indian Museum, and the Adirondack Experience, which is very much like um, old Bear Page Red, where they show you what it was like to live back in the olden day. Um, what's nice about the Adirondack experience, though, is it's on a lake. So there's boating and um, water activities over there, and um, it's quite fun. And there's all kinds of outdoor recreation. Everything you could possibly want is somewhere in the Adirondacks, whether it's hiking or biking or um, mountain biking or water sports um, is there. So I'm gonna tell you about my absolute favorite place in the Adirondacks. And I was really surprised by this because when we went, I figured it would just be a little day trip that would keep my kids um, entertained for the day. And uh, this is the Wild Center. So the Wild Center is in the Tupper Lake area and it is a fantastic museum and like preserve. Um, so inside that building that you're looking at, that's on this um, man-made uh, pond, um, and the pond goes right up to the window level. It's really something to see. You can sit in their cafe, have a cup of coffee, and have this beautiful vista. They have um, a lot of wonderful interactive uh, exhibits. The naturalist cabinet, for instance, are literally these little cabinets and drawers where kids open them up and they see all kinds of um, animal and science oriented lessons. Um, and they don't even realize they're learning. Um, Otter Falls is just that. It is this indoor um, place where they have made a home for otters. 
and it's um, glassed in. So you can see the otters on many levels. You can see them under the water, you can see them on land, you can see them swimming, and they even have um, these tubes. So when the otters get tired of being viewed and being watched by humans, they actually have um, another place that they can go, um, which is more private. So it's a, a nice place and they have um, different parts of the time of the day, they will have feeding activities and um, you know, naturalists talk about um, their, their living patterns. Uh, the Living River Trail is just that. They have um, this river that goes through the museum and um, part of it is animals that live in the river and they are actually living in that river right now. Um, and the uh, people will tell you um, how the animals live and what their characteristics are. Um, and so it's a nice way of celebrating nature um, by looking at nature in a controlled environment. The outside of the Wild Center has three wonderful walking trails. It's 115 acre ground. And they have these two things that I think are really fun and distinctive. One is called Wild Walk and the other one is Eye Forest. So this is a picture of Wild Walk. And the idea of Wild Walk is what does it look like if you lived in the trees? And so it is a structure um, that is handicapped accessible. It is, um, you can push a wheelchair or a baby carriage up the pathway. It's a little you know, steep to do so, but you can. And they have all these interactive um, outdoor like kind of play houses. So you can see what it's like to like, that's what, this picture is a nest. What it's like to be a baby bird. You go into this nest and this would be your viewpoint. This would be your perspective. Um, they have a giant spider web, not made out of gos gossamer threads, but of rope that you can climb into and explore as if you were a spider walking in your web. There's the ultimate tree house um, up in the tops of the trees. Um, and you just kind of go through this wild walk and experience that kind of tree level environment really gives you that like eagle's eye perspective. A very nice thing. Eye forest um, is a really interesting concept. So they put 21 speakers within this forest walk and it's a very easy forest walk. Um, it's you know kind of these uh, dirt trails uh, with leaves, um, very kind of a deciduous forest. And the idea behind it was um, to have storytelling and music along your walk as part of your journey. So the music was composed by Pete Wire, who's a British composer, and then taped, um, uh, they had a chorale sing it. And so it's kind of this like beautiful wordless uh, sound that is haunting and it follows you through the forest as you're walking. And it segments in the forest, they read a story. Um, so you're hearing, it's almost like the trees are telling you a story and singing. It's really quite uh, a distinctive experience. I really have to say, I loved it. Um, so that was my favorite place and the Adirondacks. Um, they also at the, the Wild Center do behind the scenes tours. Um, my kids took one of those and they had a great time with it. Their favorite part was there's these giant freezers um, behind the scenes. And my son said, what's in the freezer? And they flipped it open and there was hundreds of dead frozen rats that they feed the animals. A uh, sight that I can't unsee, but my kids love that part. That was their, the highlight of their tour. So you can kind of get these behind the scenes looks um, at the Wild Center. One thing that I love also about um, New York State is you can see um, wonderful, not only wonderful artwork and art gardens and sculpture parks, but you can see the places where some really significant artists lived. Um, and the three I really want to talk about today is Olana, uh, which was the home of Frederick Church, um, the Thomas Cole National Historic Site, and the Edward Hopper House. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about these people and then I'm gonna show you some pictures. So um, Frederick Church um, was part of the Hudson River School and he was known for his landscape pictures. Um, you can see the heart of the Andes, which is a picture he painted uh, with, with after his experience in Ecuador. 
um, church would spend a lot of time traveling the world and doing pictures. And so uh, he's also known for picture, painting a picture called the Parthenon, a picture called the Icebergs. Um, and finally, after all his traveling, he decided he wanted to create his ultimate home. And he wanted to live on top of a hill. So Alana is one of these places where you drive all the way up. Um, it takes you, hmm, depending on how fast you drive, three to five minutes to climb this hill in your car. And when you arrive there, you see this amazing, beautiful Persian-inspired home. Um, the grounds are just stunning. Uh, there's several uh, walking trails there and there's carriage roads. Uh, you can take a walking tour. You could take a driving tour if you rather. Um, church uh, is very much contemporary of Cole. Um, Cole was his teacher when he was a boy and their work is um, a little bit similar. Um, Olana, uh, I love to visit. It is just the beauty, the spectacle, the uh, views from the top of the hill um, are just magnificent. And um, it's very much, they were very much when I, I just went back there um, like three weeks ago and they were very laid back about letting people picnic and sit out and enjoy the view. Uh, so it's a really wonderful place to stop. Um, dog friendly, if you have a leash dog. Um, I don't know if this is important to you, but I always like a good clean bathroom. And so they have uh, bathrooms open to the public and in this day and age, that's a nice thing to have. Um, and you can tour the house and the, the house is quite beautiful. And then you'll learn all about uh, church and his travels and his, and his life uh, there. Uh, the Thomas Cole National Historic Site. Um, Cole, as I said, was the, is part of the Hudson River School. He was the founder. And um, he was English born um, and he was known also for his um, landscapes. Um, and I'll show you his site in a second. And the Edward Hopper House. Um, so Edward Hopper um, is a famous 20th century painter. Um, he's known as an American realist. And, you know, you might know that picture on the right, the Nighthawks. Um, that's in the Chicago Institute of Art. You can see it there. Uh, he is very much known for um, painting in oil and watercolor. And his uh, work is, I always have this kind of like little lonely gasp in it, um, featured isolated figures. Um, and he did interesting things with light. Anyway, the Edward Hopper House is his birthplace. And, you know, he spent, um, you know, good two decades of his life uh, living there. So here's some pictures of Olana. Um, and, uh, you know, they just really just don't do it justice. Um, the house, you can see, it's just a beautiful house. It sits, it sits on top of the hill. Um, when you go inside to tour, the picture on the left-hand side is their um, informal dining room. Um, and... Uh, down here is um, his studio, or what was his studio. Um, so you can see, see that it's a, a really stunning place. There's a huge uh, man-made uh, pond on the property uh, that his four children used to do boating and swimming activities. Uh, Thomas Cole is in the same area. Um, in fact, you can drive, it's 10 minutes away. So you can see both in the same day. And his house is a lot more simpler. Um, you know, he has a property that reminds me very much of the Walt Whitman house, if you've ever been there in Huntington on Long Island, where you, um, you know, there's a couple of houses you can visit. Um, so he has his studio on the property, what he calls the new studio, which was an updated studio, and then there's a barn. Um, the barn is where they do their educational programs, and they have a gift store in there. What's nice about this is um, the property has enough outdoor area that you can really social distance without, um, you know, too much trouble. Um, Edward Hopper is up in Nyack, the Edward Hopper House. While you're there, you can also see the um, Rockland Muse uh, Art Museum, Roca, because um, that's about 10 minutes away from that site. Uh, one of the things I love about the Hopper House is I really enjoy understanding how someone became an artist. And you really get that understanding um, through his house. 
Now, Hopper was one of these people who identified what he wanted to do early on. And so the house is filled with early um, work that he did and relics. And um, I especially love visiting his bedroom. Um, so this, is, this picture is a picture of his bedroom where he would do a lot of his painting. And uh, it is said that this is where he learned how to play with light because the lighting in this area is just so wonderful. It's really warm and vivid. And I just love being able to walk on the floorboards that Edward Hopper walked on, looking at the light the way he saw it. Um, it really gives you insight into the artist. Uh, the other thing is this house has a, a lovely backyard as well. Um, in normal times, they usually have concerts and stuff. Right now, um, you really can just walk back there and, and enjoy the environment. Finally, um, one of the things my family loved doing while we were researching this book was enjoying these caverns, going like caving. Um, so there's two caves that are literally like five minutes away from each other. So I want to tell you a little bit about them. We visited both. You could visit either or both as well. How Caverns, you've probably heard about. It's really developed. Um, they have uh, an adventure park there, they have a motel, they have a restaurant, a cafe, um, and the cave is very developed. Um, what I mean when I say that is it's really anybody can go in this cave, whatever your situation. If you just broke your ankle, you go and walk around and I have a problem um, because they have an elevator that takes you down the 150 feet down to the cave. And when you get there, um, there, you'll be walked through with a tour, with a tour guide who will point out different stalactites and stalagmites and uh, rock um, things that they want to show you in different spectacular areas. Um, but the paths are very easy to walk on. They've been polished. Um, you're not going to slip. It's an easy way to see a cave. Um, and one of the nice things is there's also a boat ride. So you actually get into a boat and you go down this underwater cavern. For people who are more adventurous, How Cavern also has all these kind of adventure tours where you can do spelunking and other things if you look on the website. One of the things I love about How Caverns is they have all these like crazy theme nights. Um, so for Halloween, if you look up on their website right now, they have all kinds of Halloween nights. Um, one of the funny things they have is they have a nudist night once a year. I can't imagine going through a cave and a boat ride naked, but they have it. This seems to be a market for it. Um, Secret Caverns is a little bit different. Secret, Secret Caverns are for those of you who want a rustic adventure. Um, when you go through here, and you can see it kind of has this like 60s vibe with the painting. It's all painted inside. It's very rustic. They have a fun gift shop. Um, but you go into the cave and it is kind of rugged. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, I think somebody could really plummet to their death if you're not careful. Uh, the, the steps are very wet and slick because it's cool in the cavern. They have these kind of rickety banisters. So it's a real adventure. There's some moments where you have to kind of sidle your way through these different cave areas. Um, my kids loved it because uh, the tour guide allowed them to pick up some rocks and bring them home. And um, so it's, it's kind of fun. So you can see how caverns, very polished. They have things uplit in the most beautiful way. Um, here's a picture of the boat ride. And um, this is the difference, this is Secret Caverns. So Secret Caverns, um, again, very rustic. The man who will give you, or the woman who gives you the tour, literally like flick, flicks up the switch and the lights go on. And before he leaves, he turns off the switch. So the lights will go off so they can save energy. Uh, there's a moment at the cave where he'll turn off all the lights and um, it, you'll really know how dark dark can be. And um, this is kind of what everybody goes to see. So they have this um, cave waterfall that they'll take you to. Um, it's one of the reasons why I think some of the pathways are so slick. Um, you'll definitely come out of secret caverns if you're not careful with like mud on your shirt because you're kind of squeezing through the different um, cave areas. But it's kind of fun being adventurous. Um, if that's your thing. So that's my formal presentation. Um, like I mentioned, New York Day Trips by Theme is available through Barnes & Noble, Amazon, bookshop.org. Um, I know in the chat, um, my website where you can buy it was put up. 
And um, at this point, I just wanted to see if anybody had any questions. Um, and I see that somebody asked about ticks on the trails. Um, so on the trails, um, yes, there, you, you, you can see ticks on, not, not that you'll see ticks on the trail, but you do have to be careful. Um, I always have my kids do a tick check after they finish their hike. Um, in fact, about three weeks ago, our dog um, got a tick. Um, we you know, pulled it out with tweezers, she was fine. She has her tick medication, um, but it is definitely something you wanna be careful about. But if you stick to the trails and you use your bug spray, um, we really don't have any problem. I mean, the tick on my dog was the only tick we found um, so far this summer. And we go hiking at least once a week, every week. Uh, if anybody else has any questions, if you wanna throw them up on the chat, I'm happy to answer anything you want. Um, if I didn't cover an uh, area that you would wanna hear more about, um, I could talk a little bit more about other areas, it's up to you. Thank you so much, Sandra. Let me stop the recording here so that people can speak freely if they wish to ask you some questions. Hold on one second. <laughs>